Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Ad Project Podcast. As always, I'm your host, and today I'm joined by Mr. Matt Wickland. Matt, how are you doing today? Feeling refreshed, feeling renewed, a lot of new exciting features and Amazon advertising. I'm excited to talk through them. I like it. I like it. As Matt just said, what we're planning to do today for the podcast is to dig into, we've had a ton of new features that have come out over the last couple of weeks. So I think there was one week straight where every single post I did was a new feature that we had just found within that week. Um, so we've got a, no, a ton of new features to catch up on. So we figured today we could just probably spend the whole podcast just talking about these new features. So um, yeah, I, I think we can probably just dig in if you're good with that. Yeah, totally. Um, let's see, probably one of the biggest ones that we saw, um, was sponsor products, rule-based bidding. Um, so this one got, uh, I got really excited when I saw it, uh, when we did our post, this one got a ton of interaction with it. So Matt, maybe can you walk us through, you know, some of the key pieces for what this looks like? And then I I can also add in some details there too. Yeah. So rule-based bidding, uh, is Amazon automated optimization, uh, for the keywords and product targets within your campaigns. Uh, at a high level, what you do is you set a ROAS target and uh, as an option, a cost per click guardrail, and then Amazon will automatically optimize bids to try and achieve that ROAS for that campaign. Uh, so it seeks to maximize sales while staying within that ROAS target that you provide. Uh, if that ROAS target isn't feasible. Like if I set a 1% ROAS target with a campaign and it can't achieve it after a period of time, it abandons the rule and just flags it as as not feasible. So it's a really cool new feature that um, helps with bid optimization. Uh, For us, we have our own proprietary tech, obviously, you know, really advanced bid algorithms, but there's still a place for things like this for even agencies and not individual sellers. Like this is a great way to feed our system with all new data points and potentially different bids that we can then reference and use our own software to, to essentially learn from and, and leverage. Um, but for the individual seller, it's just an added control, uh, that helps them achieve their campaign objectives. Yeah. Yeah. And overall, like Matt said, I mean, we're definitely going to be split testing this and seeing how it's going and we're, we'll end up picking whatever bid algorithm is working better. I'm going to assume it's going to be ours from the start. Um, over time, Amazon's going to continue improving. We're going to continue testing. So, um, yeah, this one's really exciting. Um, some, some specific details for it. So when you set your bid guardrail, um, Amazon guarantees that they're not going to exceed the bid guardrail by more than 25%. Um, Amazon doesn't guarantee that can achieve the ROAS target and it's going to revert back to the original settings. Like Matt said, if the campaign is not meeting the ROAS target for a 21 day period, um, currently it's only available for sponsored products, um, can be applied to auto keyword or product targeting campaigns, but the, um, campaigns must be running for a minimum of 30 days and they had to have at least 30 conversions in the last month. Um, also note that minimum budget needs to be at least $10 a day. Um, and right now we were just seeing it rolled out to specific accounts, assuming that it's going to keep rolling out. So if you're not seeing this right now, um, definitely keep checking it out. Um, so some key questions that we got, so is this the end for software and automation and everything else like that? What's your take? Definitely not. I don't. Yeah, I, I really don't think so. Obviously, we need to split test it against our software and see how it performs, what its utility is. But I see this as more of a, a boon to software and um, tech. Like we're an agency, we have our own software. The way I expect to incorporate it is to have it feed our system with fresh data points that our own algorithms can then learn from. So maybe running it for a one week on, three weeks off, or two weeks on, two weeks off, staggering uh, between Elgo's to split tests and also continually refresh bids to get the the most out of campaigns. Um, yeah, it's difficult to say, like, you know, how advanced the Elgos are that they're using. And again, like, if your ROAS objective that you set isn't feasible, the rule's abandoned. 
And that's not a constraint that like other software needs to live with. Sure. So I think it's a, a step in the right direction to help sellers manage their campaigns more effectively, more cost efficiently. Uh, but I don't think it's a replacement for these more advanced platforms that exist out there. What are your thoughts? Yeah. So my take is, you know, one, we've been expecting these changes for quite a while. Like we've seen this on the Google and the Facebook side for quite a while. Um, and so th these were some pieces that, you know, I've been expecting to see. And so it's awesome to see, cause like you were saying, especially when you're starting out, this just gives you more control or easier control of your campaigns as you go. Um, for us, how we look at our software is it's a way to kind of fill in a bunch of the gaps that we find within the Amazon advertising system. One would be that we didn't have any controls like this before. Um, and so we'll keep testing it. And if for whatever reason this performs better, which I don't think it will, but if it does, you know, we could transition to this for bidding. Again, I don't think it's going to perform better, but we're always going to test and whatever it does best at the end of the day, that's what we're going to implement for our clients overall. And so personally for us, our software is more a tool to help us implement and scale all the things that we're looking to do. Um, however, if you're just looking to get started and you were looking at some basic software, maybe this does meet the needs for you and helps take one of those key pieces that that software could provide. So I don't know, overall, I see Amazon continually rolling out more and more items to help automate the campaign structure process. So some of those basic tools may not have as much of a place in the market anymore. But then once you start getting into a lot more of the details and integrating the different campaign types together, and now how do you incorporate DSP and how do you set different strategies for different campaigns and all the level of detail there, you're just not going to be able to automate that overall. So once you get up to those next levels for advertising, I don't see this having much of an impact. Um, however, it's another tool that we'll definitely test and see if we can utilize as we go. Uh, if anything, we can test it and have it feed our systems to better fine tune our bidding algorithms if it's useful. Um, and if not, you know, we'll just keep testing it because it's going to improve over time, just like the rest of Amazon's tools. For sure. Yeah. And I'm happy you brought up DSP because something very similar has existed with DSP, uh, automated optimization, which optim optimizes bids and budgets uh, for line items within an order. So there's always been this automated optimization component of DSP. And the way we've integrated it into our software is we've built a complementary system structure. So our, our tech does all the things that Amazon's automated optimization doesn't with some checks and balances for the automated optimization too. Um, like it doesn't appropriately escalate bids. It doesn't appropriately factor in seasonality. It doesn't adjust frequencies. It doesn't control supply. Um, there are all of these wrinkles, elements, and like layers of campaign controls, um, that all tie together. Um, many of which it doesn't touch. So rule-based bidding will be fairly similar. I'm sure, you know, like on the placement side, how effectively does it tie into top of search uh, placement settings or product page placement settings and knowing your campaign's underlying strategy. If it's a ranking campaign, um, you know, is it appropriately targeting the right KPI? You know, ROAS isn't the right KPI there. So um, conversion rate is. So it's, it should be a good compliment, I think. Yep. Yeah. So another tool that we've got, um, if you've been listening to us for any period of time, you know that while we're big believers in the tech and the software to do some of the heavy lifting in the background, you know, some of the major inputs are what are those goals and how are you steering the software as you go? If you don't have the right goals from the start, it's never going to be able to take that into account. There's so much intuition that goes into it too. Um, so again, awesome tool, super excited to see this and start testing it as we go. Um, and see how we can utilize it. So really cool. And hope we, we start seeing more rule based optimizations like this in the future. Yeah. A few new features that we've touched on, uh, pivoting away from rule based bidding. Uh, we've touched on these in a previous podcast, but since this is an, a new feature, new introduction episode, we have to touch on them. Yeah. Sponsored display. So there are a couple of really cool new features that have rolled out in the last few months. Uh, I would say the most notable probably arguably is uh yeah the the updated lookbacks for view based targeting and purchase uh based targeting um purchase especially is huge so before you were 
you had to use a seven, 14 or 30 day look back window for purchases. And for pretty much the vast majority of products on Amazon, the per repurchase window is going to be around 30 days or longer in most cases, very rarely is it shorter. So by limiting it to a 30 day max, you were reaching only an audience that had very recently purchased the product. Somebody in the last couple of days, you know, you're retargeting in, in that pool too. So Amazon extended lookbacks for purchases, uh, to seven, 14, 30, 60 is new, 90 is new, 180 is new, 365 is new. So with those extended look back windows, you can reach an audience that purchased longer ago and get them to re make a repeat purchase again. Mm -hmm. And even if your products like consumable has, say it's a supplement with a 30 count of capsules and you take one daily, like if people take it religiously every single day, it's out in 30 days, like 60 or 90 days is a much more appropriate look back for people that pur purchase that product and for driving repeat purchases. Yep. You really don't want to hit that audience that's going to buy it otherwise. Yeah. Or is on subscribe and save. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You don't want to target somebody with a 14 day look back window when it's typically going to take them 60 days to run out or 30 days in your instance. Um, so yeah, that was really exciting. And then the, the other piece was for views remarketing. Um, they also added look back windows of 60 and 90 days. So now we have options of seven, 14, 30, 60, and 90 days for um, views, which is great. That's cool. Um, as we get further on in like the Q4 shopping season, you can extend those look back windows to keep um, targeting people over the Black Friday, Cyber Monday um, weekend if you want to. Um, as we've talked about in the previous episode, um, just note that as you extend these look back windows too, especially for reviews remarketing um your your return that you're going to get your acos or roas is probably going to be a little bit worse as you extend it out further and further just because that audience is not going to be as warm whereas for purchases it's more about timing it on the, the right time when you're going to get that repeat purchase for a consumable product so a little bit different there and how you look at extending out the windows but in any case it's awesome that we now have more control longer look back periods that we can incorporate for both of these um, let's see what another one that we've got is the, um, if we look at the recommended keywords, um, in our sponsor product campaigns, uh, we started seeing a couple of cool metrics that were included. Um, so one is impression share and the other one is impression rank. So essentially where we saw these is we went into sponsored product campaigns, um, we went in our target sections, we went to add keywords, and then when it listed different suggested keywords below that, we saw an IS and an IR. And essentially what this means is that for a new recommended keyword, if I add that in, and I add it in at the suggested bid that they have, um, what's the impression share, which means the percentage of impressions that I'm getting from this term relative to all the impressions that it's generating. Um, so for instance, if a thousand people search for basketball, um, and I am served, my ad would be served 200 times. That would be 20% impression share overall. Um, and so impression share, it's cool. It just shows you kind of like your, your market share that you're getting for that search term to be shown for it. Um, and then impression rank is kind of like a stack rank. So in the previous instance, if it's me and 10 competitors that are all bidding on the keyword basketball, um, obviously it's going to be a lot more, probably a bad example, but we'll just say it's 10 people who are bidding on the keyword basketball. Say I'm getting a 20% impression share, but the top person who's bidding is getting a 30% and then everybody else is below us. That top person who's getting a 30%, they would get ranked one. I would get ranked two, and then the other 10 people who are bidding on it would get ranked three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, so the stack rank is, the impression rank is kind of, it's a stack rank to show how you compare to the different competitors um, for major keywords. Say if I target like iPhone case, there's going to be a ton of people who are bidding on that. And so my impression rank could be in the hundreds or thousands. Um, my impression share could be on like the 0.1% or, you know, one to 2%. So even if you're only getting a couple percent of impression share, your impression rank is going to be that stack rank. You could be really high with one to 2% if it's a super competitive keyword, or if it's really niche, you could be a hundred percent if you're the only person 
person who is um, bidding on that keyword itself. So overall, it, it's another cool metric that you can look at based off of your bid, and then you can make bid adjustments based off of them. So say you want to dominate a certain keyword and you're getting an impression rank of 10. I, maybe you want to bid higher than that suggested bid. So for like ranking strategies, this gives us another good basis to base our initial bids off of overall. So Matt, any other pieces that you would add for impression share and impression rank? No, I think you covered it really well. Um, I guess one note is we've been really tied in with the product teams at Amazon that are working on suggested bids, suggested keyword algos. And there have been a lot of advancements behind the scenes too, and a lot of new exciting things to come there. So it's always fun seeing improvement in these areas. It, it helps keyword research so much and gives you a really good benchmark with where you want to start bidding. Like yep. you said. Yeah. So a ton of great data points. And it, like I would use these all as benchmarks and then make your decisions based off the, the more data, the better that we have to make these initial decisions. We don't just rely on the suggested bids, but that taken into account with now these new data points for impression share and impression rank, it just gives us more information to set those right initial bids. And then based off of our performance and strategy, we'll adjust as we go. So if you're looking for this again, um, check out your sponsored products, manual campaigns, going to add a keyword. And then if you see IS and IR right below the suggested keyword, um, then that's going to be, um, you, you're going to know you have the new feature. Um, and then another one before we move on to that too, is th there's also a new like, sort by feature. So if you go to recommended keywords, you can sort, sort by um, either orders or clicks. Um, so if you're looking for more of a click based, um, just trying to get more traffic to your listing, you can sort by clicks. If not, you can sort by orders and it kind of stack ranks the keywords based off of which keywords they think are going to generate the most orders or clicks as you go. Yeah. What else we got, Matt? Uh, so new sponsored brand optimization option. So you can choose now to optimize for new to brand, to have Amazon optimize uh, for new to brand customers versus immediate sales or just a, like a generic audience. So this is a new like placement-esque feature that's integrated into some accounts right now, but expect a much larger rollout. It's also available through the API. Um, where, yeah, basically you can choose, um, I want to maximize for immediate sales, a generic audience, or I want to bid higher for new to brand customers. Uh, I think this is especially valuable for anybody with a consumable. So new to brand business is huge there. Anytime there are repeat purchases, high LTV, like you want that new customer. You want to market towards somebody that hasn't purchased your product already. Being able to reach that audience specifically and push your new to brand strategies more aggressively is a very welcome addition. Yeah. Yeah. So just some, some extra detail there. Um, so like for automated bidding with sponsor brands, so it's going to automate the bids other than top of search placements. If you have that turned on um, within the API, you can now pick if we want to maximize immediate sales, which is currently tuned to, or to try to maximize new to brand customers. Um, so that's really cool. Like Matt was saying, um, new to brand customers, especially if we typically get a lot of repeat purchases from new to brand customers, um, they can have a high lifetime value. And so we may want to bid more for those new to brand customers to try to drive more in. Um, and so if we're optimizing to, for new to brand, automated bidding will set higher bids for people that have not purchased from your brand before. Um, and then there's also capability to set higher custom bid adjustments for new to brand shoppers if we don't have automated bidding turned on, which is another cool feature. So video is not supported currently in the US market. And just to clarify this right now is just only available via the API. Um, but eventually we're, we're expecting it to roll out into the ad consoles too. So another new feature that we're definitely looking at testing since we're all tied into the API, it's a lot of fun to do. Um, so yeah, another cool optimization feature that we've got available. Um, let's see what else we got. So another one that we had was automated translation of keywords. So this one popped up too in the ad console and it's another cool feature. Um, so say we're in the German market. Um, but English is our primary language. 
um, what this new translation feature allows us to do is we can enter a list of keywords in English and it's going to automatically translate to the specific um, language of that market. Um, so for instance, for the German market, we could add in a, um, a list of different keywords um, and then say, all right, translate to German. It's going to translate that to us when we, or that to German when we add those in. Um, and then another cool feature that we saw is in some of these markets that have keywords that are not in our native language. Um, it'll show, say, it'll show the German keyword that it's being targeted, but below that, it'll have a translation to English too. Um, so it just gives us a lot more control to be able to see all the keywords in our native language and potentially input those in in our native language and have it translate. Um, as always for these translations, make sure you check them out after they're in to make sure they make sense. Um, but this, this is another cool feature that makes it even easier to launch campaigns in new countries and quickly review results, especially for keywords that are not in native language. Yeah. Amazon's emphasizing like cross market scale scalability to a very large degree. So there have been a lot of new localization features like those keyword translations, there are also product target translations, uh, so finding comparable ASINs cross-market. Um, with keyword localization, you can get those translations, uh, but through the API, you can also map one language's keywords to any combination of multiple markets, so you can do it en masse, uh, which helps a lot for you know launching, say, a new product in five different markets. Um, cuts down on, like, the tedious burden of having to structure these campaigns over and over, manually do these translations, all that good stuff. Um, there are also ad or product localizations too. So the products within an ad group uh, within your campaign, moving from mark to market, if the ASIN changes, if the SKU changes, it'll auto localize that too to whatever, whatever you have in that market, which is really cool. It just, it helps with campaign scale uh, when you're launching in several different markets and, um, Currency conversion is a component of it too, which is exciting. Uh, since that's always you, you, you always have to check, you know, like is this competitive for that market? Because there's varying degrees of competition in every Amazon market, but just having that initial translation there as a benchmark or a basis is really helpful. So, yeah, for instance, when we're it. when we're optimizing for the Mexican market or the the Japan market, like the the currencies are much different, and so it always takes a bit to recalibrate to the local currency or U.S. dollars. So, yeah, yeah. very cool. And Amazon, so as a component of this, this is in the API release notes, but they're leveraging a new machine learning algorithm um, that uses combinations of similarity between words and Amazon advertising and search data to find the best matching. So there are these translations. Uh, there have been translations through localization previously too. Um, they've improved it with a new algorithm and it's going to continue to learn and get better and better and better as time progresses. So translation quality should is better today and it'll be even better tomorrow. Yep. Like any any of these new features, don't just try it and say it doesn't work after initially trying it. Like as they get more and more usage and data, they're going to continue to fine tune it as we go. Um, let's see another new update. So we hit sponsor display and we were talking about the look back windows, um, but they also updated different bidding types too. Maybe you want to walk through that one quick. Yeah. So you can select a, a build type or bidding type when you're creating a sponsor display audience targeting campaign uh, and choose between CPC, the traditional sponsored ad pricing model, or CPM, which is cost per mil or cost per 1,000 impressions. Uh, we've talked about this a bit in previous podcasts, but uh, the benefit of CPM um, is it's more industry standard. So there are a lot of off Amazon. There's so Sponsored display has both on Amazon and off Amazon supply. The typical like industry benchmark, the typical bid type for uh, third-party supply is CPM. So it kind of brings it to the industry norm, and it also aligns it with uh, higher funnel objectives. You know, typically with like in-market lifestyle audiences, reach and impressions are one of your goal KPIs, and CPM quantifies that metric in terms of cost. So it's more meaningful to an extent for those camp types of campaigns. Sure. 
Yeah. And, and so the, the big thing to just note is that the attribution model changes based off of which one you've picked. Um, so if we bid on a click basis, our attribution is going to be that to click into the ad for the sale to be attributed. Um, on a CPM basis, um, they just had to view the ad. And then if they go and purchase that product later, that sale is going to get attributed. So um, this is going to put you more on common footing in between DSP and sponsored display um, if you use CPM um, attribution. But just note that if you're comparing now a sponsored display on CPM versus the rest of the sponsored ad types, they're all on a cost per click basis. So just make sure you're making that distinction in the attribution model um, from the view based model. You're going to get more attributed sales because um, more people are going to view than click. Um, so just know it if you're comparing ROAS or ACOS between the two. Just make sure attribution model is the same. And if not, definitely take that into account. Um, and then final update that we've got, uh, Amazon keeps rolling out support to different markets. Um, so they just recently added API support for Sweden. Um, so this puts us at 15 markets now that we've got API access. Um, so US, Canada, Mexico, the UK, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Australia, Japan, UAE, Brazil, Netherlands, Singapore, and now Sweden. Um, so yeah, it, it's awesome to be integrated to the API, to all these different markets. We support all these different markets. Um, it's fun to see them increasing their support overall. And, um, honestly pretty easy to update and integrate into these different markets as we go. So excited to add Sweden to the list. Yeah. yeah well, I, we just covered a lot. We miss anything? Probably there have been so many feature rollups, yeah. But that was a pretty good list. Yeah, that's our main list. If we think of any other ones, we'll definitely add them in and next upcoming podcasts and everything. So, um, yeah, we'll wrap it up. I mean, we've had a ton of new features. So, um, key message is these are all great to test. And then the other key message is even if you test them initially and they don't perform as well as you think or don't perform as well as you'd like them to perform, um, just know that they're constantly being tuned up in the background too. So um, if you try them out right now, they don't work, I would circle back in a couple months and try them out again. Um, we're going to be continually testing all these as we go. Um, lots of fun. Great job to the Amazon advertising team just continually adding new features. Um, keeps us busy, um, but it's a lot of fun. It always gives us an extra item that we can utilize to try to give our clients an edge, which is which is great. Yeah. So, well, this has been another episode of the Ad Project Podcast. Um, as always, thanks for listening. Um, and just know too, if you're ever looking for, if you like video instead of audio, um, note that we post all these podcasts on our YouTube channel. So you can check out the Ad Advance YouTube channel. Um, and as always, thanks for listening and we will see you on the next episode.